talking about the church. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. What Paul's talking about is uh, you as the church and God's people, and, and by this stage of the Bible story, Jesus is, is gone off earth back into heaven, and, and Paul is saying, if you've caught a glimpse of Jesus, even an obscure glimpse, when he says beholding in a mirror, he was talking about the mirrors of the day, which were literally just polished metal, generally brass, and they would polish brass up as far as, as polished as they could get it. And generally, they weren't flat and straight sheets. They were bent and wrinkly things that had been hammered out. And they would polish them and they would look. And so you would get a bit of an image. You could sort of see yourself. And Paul's saying that's a bit like what it's like following Jesus. That it takes faith. It requires faith. And, but you get glimpses of Jesus. And as you do, the Holy Spirit works on you. As you see who you could be and who you should be, the Holy Spirit empowers you and you actually get changed from the inside out. He says from glory to glory. So sort of in, in one sense, interestingly, that word literally means weight, glory. And, and it's like, can I put it this way? You increase in substance yeah. as a person. As you allow God to change you. For example, maybe you throw off some of the things that were just shallow and, and, and small about your life. Negativity, critical words, whatever it might be. You begin to shed some of the stuff that made you a smaller person. And you go from glory to glory. In other words, your life begins to take on greater substance. You become a person who's actually bigger on the inside. And the way you view life and the way you treat people and the way you live and move and have your being in the world, you become more of a person of substance. It's interesting because often people see that or think that when you say things like God wants to change you, that it's arrogant. It's like, I don't need changing. I don't want changing. And, you know, how arrogant it is that God would think that I need change. Uh, but the fact is, I think if, if you're realistic, um, if you're thinking that way, you're not listening to the people around you because no matter how good you're doing with your friends, most of them would be able to give you a list of things that could change in your life. So God's determination to change us is kindness. Uh, you could put it this way, and I think this is a great, the this is a great theology. It's not in the Bible, but it's a great distillation of thoughts about God and that is God loves you just the way you are but he loves you too much to leave you that way <laughs> that's the thought he does accept you the way you are your changing does not change his love for you it doesn't increase it it's been said this way that there's nothing you could do that would make God love you less and there's nothing you could do that would make God love you more. His love, his acceptance, his forgiveness is, is established. It was, it was demonstrated to us on the cross of Calvary. God loves us and that nothing's going to change that. But he loves us too much to let us stay in some of our shallow, unsubstantial ways, if I could put it that way. So I, I think one of the most fantastic things... God offers us is definitely change. Uh, you know, otherwise, if, if change is not possible, otherwise you are, you're doomed to sameness. If change is impossible, or even if change, some people think they don't desire change. But, but interestingly, this message kind of flows on from this morning where I, I actually talked about anxiety and stress and how we can deal with that and cope with it, the, the things God has given us to deal with the pressure of modern life, which statistically our society is in a mess in that sense, with anxiety, depression, etc., running rampant. And we looked at that, and in, in a way, I'm sort of continuing this, that thought. I think this morning was something like Dr. God's recipe for, success, or recipe for stress-free living, something like that. That's my extended title. I think it was Divine Stress Management was the working title. Um, 
But you think about it, one of the things that is most stressful, can be most stressful about life is the inability to change. The feeling that you're stuck in a rut, that life is not moving on, that life is not progressing. Uh, There can be nothing worse than literally living as like the old movie Groundhog Day. And if you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Groundhog Day where this guy just keeps waking up to the same day again and again and again until something changes in his heart and he can move on. There's a great lesson in the movie. But to live the same day again and again, again and again and again is actually stressful. To live without hope of things being different. We've got a saying in our society, the de- definition of insanity is to do the same thing again and again and again, expecting a different result. And yet some people think that they'll be happy in life if they could just do that. But even if you find a sweet spot, who's noticed that sweet spots, they're they're sort of like mountain peaks. They're they're awesome to achieve, but you you can't really live there. You know, I don't know of anyone who's climbed some great mountain, whether it's Kosciuszko or Kilimanjaro or, you know, whatever, Everest. They climb it, they put a They put a flag in it, then they get the hell off the mountain, man. Because it's just unrealistic to try and live. That's just not just not life. So even if you found a sweet spot and try and pitch your tent there, life does move on. And you become redundant there. And life gets anxious there because there is this impending sense of, man, I've got to get moving with my life again. So I think. I think that God, the greatest thing he offers us is change. The ability to change, the power to change. That's, that's one of the things I love about it. Uh, the Apostle Paul, again, he says something in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And he makes this statement, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and that, that's a scripture that gets stuck on calendars with, uh, with athletes, you know, that are like reaching up with a basketball or they're doing some amazing athletic feat. But actually what Paul's talking about is he can cope in every situation and move his life forward no matter whether he's in lack or whether he's in abundance, whether life seems good or life is tough. He's always able to face it and move his life forward no matter what so you've been promised the power to change and I think one of the best things about it is all it takes is surrender you know I can't give you a formula for change tonight in one sense and I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to make it complicated I'd have to say you only need to do one thing for your life to change for God to do something on the inside of you where you move from being a lightweight to someone of substance The only thing you really need to do is give God permission to change you. That's it. You just need to surrender. You just need to give up holding and clinging white knuckle to your own life and your own dumb opinions. And I put myself in that category. But if you surrender and you allow God to bring change, your life will never change be the same and what Paul describes is not a moment of perfection it's not we've been changed full stop from glory to glory describes a process it describes a journey and and you might and I've got the feeling maybe you're even here tonight and you feel a bit stuck like there was a time where that was happening but I seem to be stuck well tonight I, I, I hope you kick start it again I'm going to encourage you to give God to, to kickstart your change, to kickstart your growth again and to get moving. Maybe you're moving really well, then I hope you see yourself in this, in this message as well. So I want to speak to you about the gift of change. The gift. The gift of change. Turn to, turn to the person next to you and say, change is a gift, man. Man. You've got to put the man on the end of it. Or one man. And here's the things that change. You know, when, when you give God permission, this is what happens. So you can trace this in your life. And honestly, this will help you work out whether you're actually surrendered or not, or whether you're actually giving permission or not, or whether you're likely to grow or not. 
First thing is your thinking begins to change. Your thinking begins to change. If you give God permission, he's not going to leave your mind the same. God's interested in what you think. You know, Jesus asked this question, said these words on seven different occasions. What do you think? Now, anyone who's into Bible numerics knows that seven is like also a very uh, uh, interesting Bible number. It's the number of completion. Some people call it the number of perfection or the number of God, but really it means the number of completion, often in Scripture. And seven times, it's no accident, Jesus is recorded asking people, what do you think? Because God is interested in what we're thinking. A yeah. number of other qua- uh, occasions, Jesus asked similar questions to find out about what people were thinking. Who do people say I am? Those kind of things. God is interested in what we think. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, the first part of the verse says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. It's describing a very particular kind of person, but as a general rule, it's pretty applicable. As a man thinks in his heart, as a woman thinks in a heart, as we think in our heart, that's actually what we will produce. In our secret inner world. I wonder how that's going. I mean, what's, think about it this way. Your th- thoughts, God's interested in your thoughts. We should be interested in our thoughts. What's playing on the cinema of your mind? What's playing on the big screen of your heart? Because we've all got one. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we, we probably would be horrified to think that anyone else could know what plays on the big screen of our heart. But our thinking has to change. Uh, God wants it to change. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and I shared this the, um, this morning, this verse. Paul's encouraging people after they deal with their anxiety to focus not on their anxieties but to focus on good things. And he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And, you know, that, that's not always easy. It's not always easy to think clean in a dirty world. And God knows that. But interestingly, again, another passage I want to bring up from this morning, only because I think I had so much feedback from this morning, it was really helpful for people. And that was a passage in 2 Corinthians. Again, it's the Apostle Paul talking, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. And and he says something to this effect, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, uh, but they're mighty in God and effective to pull down strongholds. Casting down vain imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. It's a, it's a mouthful of scripture, but, but here's the thing it's saying. It's saying that God gives you power yeah. to control what runs through your head. Yeah. And, and I, often we, we argue that point. We, we rationalize or we justify our stand. We say, I can't help what I'm thinking. Well, maybe before you had the Holy Spirit in you, you couldn't. But now you can. Now you have a choice that when you actually stop to think about what you're thinking about, which is often our biggest problem, we don't do enough of that. When you realize that your thoughts are taking you somewhere that you don't want to go. And people say things like, oh, but I can't help it. I just feel this way. Well, most feelings are the result of a thought process. And if you can capture your thinking, you can change the way you feel. And you're given the power to do it. As a matter of fact, Paul calls this warfare. And and funnily enough, you know, Christians for the last few decades tend to think whenever they hear that, they think demons. But there's no demons in this passage. This whole passage on spiritual warfare, one of only two in the New Testament, directly relating to the subject. And Paul says, the devil is between your ears. He's not floating around up there somewhere. It's what's going on up here. 
And Paul urges, you have got the power. The weapons of your warfare are mighty, enabling you to capture your thinking and make things that are contrary to God's word and what God's got for your life, making things contrary. Bow the knee and be obedient to Jesus Christ. You can actually change your thinking. You don't have to live as the victim of your fear. You don't have to live in anxiety and under that sort of pressure. Your thinking can change. And, and I don't want to make small of anyone who's really suffering with some of those t- tough issues of anxiety and depression. But what I am saying is God has at least given you something to fight with. You need to be aware of that and not feel like you're just at the mercy and totally a victim of what this world wants to push through your head. You're not. Man, change is a gift. If you can change what you're thinking up here, it's a gift. God's not arrogant saying we need to change. God is loving saying, man, don't let that small stuff keep you a lightweight. Capture your thinking. Let Christ reign in your thoughts. It's like a king, reign, not reign, reign. Let Christ be boss. Surrender to him and you will change. You'll change. Second thing that changes and you know that you've given God permission is when your words begin to change. When your words begin to change. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit, interestingly enough. So our confession, what we say, is critical. As, as a matter of fact, it's been put this way. I'm not sure where I got this quote. I've, I've tried to capture the essence of the quote, but I've heard it a number of times. I probably need to nail it down. You cannot consistently speak one way while you live another. You cannot consistently speak one way and live another. But you will always fall back to the pattern of your words. And Jesus said this so clear, clearly when he says that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. So you can, you, know, you can try and act one way all you like and you can fool the crowd most of the time. But your mouth is fooling no one. And wherever your words are going, your life is sure to follow. Those who love it shall eat of its fruit. In other words, today's confession or what's coming out of your mouth today is tomorrow's feast. You will be eating the fruit of your words tomorrow. And so God is intensely interested in the words that we speak and how we use our mouths. Think about it. God created the world as we know it from what is unseen using the power of his word. We are made in his image, in that same creative prophetic image. And often we're prophesying over our own life without even understanding what we're doing. But man, when you understand that and you understand that that's why God wants your words to change from negativity and from cynicism or criticism or sarcasm or gossip or slander or even just plain old filthy language, Ephesians 4.29, simply because it doesn't build anyone up. The F-bomb never made anyone feel better. Change your words, capture your words because they're a reflection of your heart. And, and maybe at some point, you've, we've all done this, you've said something that you really regret. Come on, who's ever said something you really regret? And, and maybe to the point where it's like you just wish you could get it back, but it's too late, man. It's like a bird. It has flown away and everyone knows. And I tell you, our digital signature in that area, is every bit as powerful. Our digital... What we do with pixels is every bit as important as what we do with our tongue. Because everything from a a low-end first world rant on Facebook... Have you ever read them and you just want to slap someone? I tell you what, go, go to Sri Lanka, you want to slap someone when you get back for some of the things you read. From that right through to... Just comments that 
destroy people that are, that are literally, you know, bullying via the computer screen or the phone screen. They're things that, that have to change. God, God doesn't want you to be a lightweight. He doesn't want you to live in the realm of pettiness. Yeah. He doesn't want you to live in the realm of cheap point scoring at someone else's expense. He wants you to be a more substantial person than that. He wants you to be changed from glory to glory, weight upon weight on your life, where you're just the people around you know they're a bigger person than that. If someone even accused you of something like that, your friends around you, instead of going, yeah, no, that'd be right, they would defend you because they'd know we know them. They're not a lightweight like that. They would not speak that way. Man, change is a gift. <laughs> it's a gift. God loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. And then, of course, your actions begin to change. Your thoughts, your words, your actions begin to change. I love what James says, James chapter 2, verse 18, last part of the verse. He says, I will show you my faith by what I do. I'll show you my faith by what I do. Authentic manifestations of change. James was so confident that he'd given Jesus to bring change to his life that he, at a point, writing to the church, says, forget what I'm writing about. Just watch me go. <laughs> if, you don't, if you're not getting, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, just watch me live. Paul said something very similar. Imitate me. He could say to the church, imitate me. I'm confident you can imitate me because I imitate Christ. I'm just not talking about it. I'm not just saying I think this way. I'm living it in such a way among you that you can see that my faith is actually tangible. It's made a difference in my life. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. There's a contrast to that. Paul Funnily enough, he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I love the reality of Bible characters. Because you could be sitting here right now going, man, Chris, this is not discouraging me because I haven't changed. And even Paul felt that pressure. Yeah. Man, you know, I, I thought I would be a different person. I thought, I, I thought I'd be in a different place. And it's okay to feel that way. It's just not okay to pitch your tent there. Yeah. And say, well, I'm, I've just found my safe spot and I'm staying here because life will pass you by, anxiety will rise, and you will not be happy without change. Change. James said, I'll show you by my life. Have you ever wanted to... And, and I guess Jesus even talks about this. But have you ever wanted to chop some part of you off for the trouble it brought you? Jesus talked about this. I don't think for a moment, even though he said you should, you should pluck your eye out, you should cut your hand off, I don't think he was talking about self-mutilation. I think he was talking about our need for the awareness of change. Yeah. Yeah. Man, if, if your habits are leading you into a dark place, yeah. cut it off. Come on. Change it. You know, stop, stop exercising that and start exercising something different. Yeah. And uh, change is a gift. Yeah. Change is a gift. If your thinking is changing, your speaking is changing, so, so, so should your actions. So here's some questions for us just in closing. And maybe the, the biggest question <clears throat> I could ask, the first one, are you giving God permission to change you? As you sit here tonight, look, in all honesty, honestly, if, if, if you're stalled in your Christianity, <clears throat> you're not going anywhere and you don't want to. I'm not saying if you're struggling. I'm saying if, if you're stalled and you've flicked into neutral, you've put the handbrake on and you are determined not to shift, honestly, I don't even know why you're here. Love you to bits, and so does God. But you're wasting your time. You have permission to just leave. You're wasting your time. If we don't give God permission, again, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we're even in a good place. 
but just being open to change. God, don't leave me here. I'm not happy where I am. And if I put the handbrake on at all, it was just to stop myself rolling further down the hill. But please help, because I'm not here. Just determined to stay and remain the same, to stay small. Lord, I want you to help me become a person of substance. I want to increase. So the next question is, you know, how are you going with your thoughts? Are your thoughts changing? Because it's an indicator that you've given God permission. How do you know? How do you know you've given God permission? Or your thinking is being challenged. And, and can I say something about struggle? Because sometimes we, we think struggle is bad. I gotta say, struggle is good. <laughs> it's a sign of life. As a matter of fact, no struggle in our lives is a dangerous indicator. If you want to change, if you want to let God do something in you, there is going to be struggle. The struggle is real, is how we can say it. Struggle is good. It means there's change going on. But sometimes when we avoid pain and we avoid struggle as a habit, we unwittingly avoid growth and transformation at the same time. So don't, don't worry about the struggle. Is your thinking changing? Are your words changing for the better? Are your words changing for, 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 the, for the better? Or are you slipping back down, back into old patterns or habits, or are you actually determined to let Jesus get a hold of your tongue, knowing that it's setting the direction of your future? James says this. James says it's like a rudder on a ship. A rudder on a ship is such a small part of a ship, but it steers the whole thing through mighty oceans the same way that's our that's our words what about our actions are your actions the way that you treat people the way that you treat people in your world your parents your friends your facebook buddies or whatever your your workmates colleagues your fellow students teachers the person at the service station you buy your petrol from i believe jesus should touch every bit of that I don't think in God's world anyone is wallpaper to Him. But in our world, sometimes people that, that don't add to us directly or whatever, that we just see them as wallpaper. But, but I think when you get the heart of God, all that begins to change. You begin to treat people differently. You're a person of substance. You're not, you're not a lightweight that looks down on others as if you're superior. You're a person of substance that sees the image of God in every person. Is there an internal struggle? Here's the big question. Is there an internal struggle or are you just going with the societal flow? Just, just flowing like that. As I close, you know, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things that happens is change of belief for anyone's life. A change of belief is a change of course. Just a, a, a total change of course. For me, when I was 21, I was living for myself. In, in, all, in all honesty, I had everything that most of my mates wanted. I had the cool car and the girl and all that stuff. And yet, looking back, I was such a lightweight. <laughs> Wrapped up in my own self-image, desperately needing approval. I was such a lightweight talking and big mouth and all this stuff. Such a lightweight. But at 21 years of age, I gave God permission to bring change to my life. And I am so happy I did. And, and maybe you're here tonight and you've never got to that point, but you just recognize, boy, I need change. I think a lot of us here tonight recognize that. I guess I'm speaking specifically, just first up, if you've never let God bring change to your life, I want to give you an opportunity at the end of this service, just in a few minutes' time. I want to give you opportunity to give God permission to bring change to your life. He loves you. He's on your side. He wants what's best for you. He wants to bring change and grow you, cause your life to gain weight in that sense of substance. 
That's his desire for each one of us. And I want to give you the opportunity to change belief. And maybe you'd say, well, I haven't really been believing, but tonight I'm ready to put my faith, my trust. I'm ready to believe in Jesus Christ. That is the beginning. <laughs> that is the, that is, that's when you light the wick of change. That's when you light the fuse and change is going to happen at that point. And I want to give you the opportunity. For many of the rest of us, we just know we've just, this has been a God moment where we've seen our life as potentially stalled or maybe even rolling backward. And you just, right now, you've got a fresh commitment, a fresh desire to grow, to increase, to allow God to increase the substance of your own heart. And I really want to pray for you too. So could we all stand together? If we could all stand. And, and maybe if you're in that last group I just spoke about, it's just like, man, I know uh, God and the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that God is speaking to me, whether it's words, actions, thoughts, or just anything that, that to you is very real at the moment. And I'm just going to encourage you just to reach out to God right where you are. Why don't you shoot a hand up to heaven? And I just want to pray for us as we close the service. Thank you, Father. Come on, if that's you, just shoot your hand up. Father, I just thank you for people that are willing to say, God, help me change. Whatever I need to change, whatever I need to adjust tonight, I'm giving you permission. I'm giving you a fresh opportunity, a fresh go at my life, Lord. Just change me, touch me, help me to change. Help me to surrender my thinking to you. Help me to surrender my, my actions to, to, to you. Help me to surrender my words, my tongue, to allow you to change me just yield ourselves to you afresh Lord you know I just believe if you've raised your hand tonight just as an act of faith reaching out to God I really believe he's going to meet you in this moment he's going to meet you right where you're at touching your heart let the power of the Holy Spirit touch hearts Father tonight meet with people that are so open to you responding to your word right now in Jesus name touch them Father I pray and and just while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you know, if you know that you need change, you, you want to light the fuse for change in your life, you've, you've never given God permission in your life before tonight, but tonight you'd say, Chris, I really want to give God permission to bring change to me, then I'm just, I'm just going to remind us, please keep our eyes closed, our heads bowed. This is a really, really special moment for people. But if you're here and you've never done that, you want to then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and I want to pray for you as well, just like I prayed for other people. But you're here and you just know that's me. That's what's got to happen for me. Why don't you just shoot your hand in the air right now and then we're going to pray as well. Awesome, awesome. That's wonderful. Others, awesome. Awesome, mate. That's awesome too. Great. Others, yep, great. I see you up there as well. That's brilliant. That is fantastic. Yep, and down here over. Yep, great. That is awesome. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. God bless you. God is going to touch your life tonight. Come on, if you're here and you need to reach out in faith, you might not understand it all. I'd have to say I didn't. I didn't understand it all. All I knew was I really needed change. And I reached out to God and He met me in that moment. And if that's you, that's you. Maybe, you, you, as I said, you've never trusted God before. You never got to that point. But tonight you realize, man, I want to light the fuse. I want to give Jesus permission in my life. That is fantastic. What a brilliant response. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Father, for each person who's responded tonight. And I pray for them that you would meet them right where they're at, Father, that you would, um, you would allay their fears, you would, you would calm their heart, that you would meet them in this precious moment and affirm them with your love, affirm them with your acceptance, affirm them with forgiveness that can only come from heaven. In Jesus' name, let them experience your goodness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Why don't we just give it up for people who've taken that step towards Jesus tonight. We're going to pray this prayer together. Let's pray it together. And if you responded for the first time, make it your own. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life and I will follow you. Amen, amen. Uh, so let's go out of here. Let's go out of here determined to let Jesus make us bigger people. Amen? Awesome. Uh, thanks, James. Come and